Hi everyone, this is Art Smalley, president of Art of Lean Incorporated, and today on behalf of the Lean Enterprise Institute, I have another short video for you. Actually, today is not going to be short, it's going to be a little bit longer, but we're going to go deeper. We're going to take on the world of NBA, basketball, coaching and problem solving, study it through a lean lens a little bit, and see what we can learn. Because I think there's things that the NBA could benefit from in the way we coach and uh, couch our language for problem solving. But on the flip side, there's a ton I think we should learn from the NBA or general sports world in terms of coaching as well. So stick around, I think you're gonna like it. Okay, now in a previous video, I talked about coaching and problem solving and shared with you uh, my general view, my framework, and I'm gonna do a series of videos with LEI and at the conclusion of it, I'll explain my framework again and probably modify it based upon what I, what I learned from going through this process with you. But at a minimum, I think coaching involves recognition, recognition of types of problems and situations, um, complexity of the problem, low, medium, and high, and various skill-will combinations between the coach and the participants. And of course, beyond that, there's always urgency, external leadership, noise factors that I won't try and bring into it, but of course exist. I'm just saying at a minimum, I think about this. Now, let's go first to a five-second NBA video clip and look at an actual problem situation that was coached and practiced and put into play, okay? And I'm doing this uh, borrowing heavily from a uh, Atlanta Hawks D-League scout and coach by the name of uh, Dylan Moore. I believe that's his name anyway. I've got the, the link down below so you can study this in more detail if you want. But I'm gonna show the five second video clip and then we're gonna talk about the problem solving and coaching that led up to it. Hey, boom, it's already done. What happened there was the result of good problem solving and coaching. The defense won. Here, I'm slowing it down. Here's a pick and roll situation. A center comes over to set a screen, a defender shows, and they switch back the regular player, the guard to be on the guard, and he has to pass out to the wing. So no three-point shot was allowed, and no easy roll to the basket was obtained on this possession. So technically, the defense won that little encounter, okay? And I know that was fast, five seconds, and too fast for a lot of people who don't understand basketball. I'll break it down with slides in a little bit, but first, I wanna explain all the coaching and thought processes that went into that five seconds of play in an NBA game, okay? So, first off, you gotta understand that Problem solving and coaching, of course, goes on in sports. It's just not exactly the language and terms we use. And frankly, I wish the NBA announcers and teams would communicate it in a language that more of us can actually understand. Um, basketball or any sport is a game of situations. It's not a static one thing. In basketball, for simplicity, you can say there's offense, defense, and special teams, okay? Special situations. In offense, you can say there's transition, fast break plays off of rebounds and steals. There's inbounds plays, various types of those, and there's the traditional half-court offense. And in the half-court offense, one thing in particular you see at all levels, and it's one of the oldest plays in basketball, is called the pick and roll. And if you study basketball, it turns out there's types of pick and roll plays. There's a high version of it, there's a side version of it, there's, there's combinations between those two. And there's various combinations and permutations between who does it, the point guards, the uh, shooting guards, the, the the forwards, the centers, and, and some teams play more of a positionless style, so you gotta be prepared for all of that. Now, I'm gonna invent a specific problem, again, borrowing heavy from that example I found on medium.com and the, uh, the Atlanta Hawks D-League coach, Dylan Murphy, and this, this is made up, but it's generally true. Uh, there's an average of 100 possessions in an NBA game. The average points per game is now about 112. It's gone up in recent years. And the average margin of victory is about 10 points. It varies season by season, but it's been about 10 points. And when you think about it, that means that you need to stop them five more times a game. If you're thinking defensively, I gotta stop them from scoring five, five baskets, five times a game, assuming two point baskets for now, okay? To knock off that 10 point advantage. I gotta score more, they gotta score less. Some combination of that has to occur. And the game is won at those tight margins. Now, here's a generic situation that comes up in coaching. They do a lot of data collection, a lot of video analysis, a lot of scouting, and databases are built. It's not shown, I wish it was. An average opponent, let's say we're facing next, scores 40 points a game from the pick and roll offense. Maybe 30 points comes from other offensive sets, 20 points comes from the transition game I talked about, 
and 20 points might come from uh, turnovers, or excuse me, free throws and things like that. It, it, it's always a mixture, but they know opponent by opponent how it's coming. And let's say we're facing an opponent that's really good at the pick and roll, and we want to stop them from averaging one point per possession on that pick and roll to something lower than that. You know, the top three in the league score more than one point per possession on the pick and roll. They're very good at it. So like in problem solving, we could, and coaches do this. They set goals for the game. And of course, a generic goal we all think about as fan is let's, let's safely win the game. Let's not get injured. Let's not go into overtime. Let's just win the game. A more specific goal that coaches thinks of is let's effectively defend the pick and roll this game. More specifically, they say, let's specifically defend the side pick and roll between the point guard and center, if that's what they, they do. And I'll show an analysis of example where that's true. And we'll try and get them down from that one point per play average to 0.8. Because you're not going to stop them entirely. But if you can stop even that much across a number of possessions, it adds up and you win. Okay? So that could be a goal for an upcoming game. And to do that, of course, we have to do analysis. And this is what the TV announcers and teams don't show. I wish they did. But they analyze each other incredibly. And a pick and roll analysis might look like this. We see how their opponent scores they, 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 on that, that 40 points that I talked about. They run the high pick and roll 20% of the time, the side pick and roll 80% of the time. And the real numbers will be different. I'm just making an 80-20 rule for this example. Inside the side pick and roll, again, the point guard and center combination is done 80% of the time. Shooting guard center, 15%. Point guard, small forward, 5%. Every team's different. You got to know the data. You got to know the details of what you're going to face and how to defend it. And that's what this article by Dylan Murphy explained. And I encourage anybody who's a basketball fan to look it up and read it. Now, just like you have analysis and problem solving, in basketball you have that analysis, then you have to come up with countermeasures, ways to stop the defense. And it turns out there's five generic ways to stop the pick and roll. Of course, there's more than that. And of course, they go deeper. But you have to think through, are we going to go what's called over the screen? Are you going to teach your player to go under the screen? Are you going to double team and trap the ball? Are you going to switch? Or are you going to do what's called show? Do a, a show a switch and then go back to the uh, style that you started with. And all of these have pros and cons. And that's where, as a coach, you have to know which one's going to work better for an upcoming game. Good coaching and scouting has to prepare for all of these scenarios, not one, or just ask open-ended questions like, what do you think the problem is? What's your obstacle this game? Time out. Let me read from my card and give you some questions to ask. At the higher levels, that doesn't work for coaching NBA or even Toyota or good lean companies. Now, for those of you that are curious about the play, I'm going to break it down slides step by step. Okay. What happened was the point guard dribbled to the side. Okay, you can call and think of this as a high side, an in-between scenario, a high side pick and roll. Okay. In number two, the center. His center came over to set a screen. Okay. Create some confusion for the defense and create a way for the point guard to dribble around and get open. And what happens was in the defense, this is what uh, the, the Dylan Murphy article was explaining, the center jumps out onto the ball handler. The big jumps out on the small and shows that I'm going to switch. Okay? They make them think that I'm going to show. And in reality, they then switch back because you want the small and the small and the big on the big certain times. Not always. Depends. It's where the, games, the game planning, the scouting, analysis comes in. But they determined in this example that we don't want to go over or under or switch too fast. We want to show and then switch. And that would give us an advantage this game. For some reason, they came to believe that through film study. Okay? And in this case, they showed the switch. And it looks temporarily like they're out of position, but in reality, as they switch back, number five slide here, the player actually recovered and stopped the threat. The point guard didn't attempt a three-pointer. Uh, the center rolling to the basket was well defended. So the main options off the pick and roll were shut down right there. There was no easy drive for the guard, no easy three-point shot, and there was no easy center layup by rolling to the basket. So that you can you can conclude that it was stopped because he passed at the end of the wing. Slide number, point number six here. They passed to the wing, meaning in that five-second clip, the defense technically won. They won that little battle of exchange and stopped the play. And in the game, it's a 24-second clock with iterations. You have to do that again and again and again successfully if you want to win the game. Doing it once is not enough. You have to do it over and over. So, of course, at the end of the games, we all look at the scoreboard and say, who won? And let's say generally the team won that we were talking about this time that defended the, the pick and roll play. They, they won 110 to 2. 
The real question they go home and study, and the analytics department and the video guys stay up overnight sometimes, is how many points per possession did they get on the pick and roll play? How well did we actually cover it? That was our goal. And maybe we said we we're gonna try and hold them to 0 0.8 points per possession, but they got 0 0.85. So we were good at it, better than in the past, but we didn't really achieve our goal. But we still won because it's not a single variant analysis. There's multiple things going on. Maybe we limited our turnovers and got more points off the fast break or something like that. You know, combination of things always results in victory or loss. But look, game's on in 48 hours again. NBA's moving. You might have one in 24, 48, or 72 hours. You got another game, probably gonna face another team's pick and roll, and you have to decide which way are we gonna defend it. So they, they too have you know, follow-up action items every day after a game. They gotta review the video game with players in a meeting. They gotta review that show technique again and practice with uh, Coach Dillon. They gotta go over the specific finer points on how to show and what the offense is gonna do to counter that. And that's what his article was largely about, the show uh, defensive technique, and then the six counters you gotta know, which I'll just list here. The slip counter, the split counter, the show and tag, show empty corner, show versus pick and pop, small shows to avoid switches, the things they're gonna try and do and confuse you next time. because They've got counters to your counters. So you gotta prepare video for that, film study on various things, and you gotta practice, 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 and drill the skill repeatedly. So look, I know NBA is very different from the lean world. They get big contracts, big dollars, lots of people to study problems, but I still think we can learn a few things from this example, okay? Number one, 82 games. NBA is a long season, goes around year round, just like most of our jobs do. In that season, there's many types of coaching, many types of problems, and many types of situation and practices that they do, not just one. Second, they make very good use of video and analytics to figure out what to coach. We use analytics and lean to, to frame the problem definition, frame the analysis in our better examples. We do not do a great job of using data, video analytics to study what to coach. It's just shoot from the hip, have some questions ready, show up at a meeting and do your best. Specific game planning is important in the NBA, not just general. And in coaching and problem solving and lean, I think like this point number three, we gotta get more specific in what we're planning to coach and how to do that. Number four, practice planning with specific situations in mind. Plan for every person. The NBA doesn't coach one player. They don't just coach the guard. You gotta coach all five positions on the court and the backups. And in lean, I wish we did that better too. Let's just not pretend there's one person we're coaching, one style we're coaching. You know, what you want the ops manager to do is different from the, the lean specialist, is different from the quality manager, different from the engineering manager. Of course, they all do generally the same thing, but like in the NBA, you also have role specific things that I think we need to get better at in problem solving. Number five, I think there's highly developed standard situation awareness in basketball because they videotape it and study so much, they come up with like five ways to defend the pick and roll and know them really quickly. I wish in lean we had five ways to frame the problem, five ways to break down the problem definition, five ways to think about your goal statement, five ways to think about your root cause analysis, five ways to think about countermeasures that were more standard, and then of course variations still exist and need to be thought through, but I wish we could get that level in our coaching as well. Six, seven, and eight kind of run together, but I think the important thing was in that five second clip, you didn't see any coaching. When you're successful, you don't see the coaching, right, on the court. The coaching occurs before. Adjustments occur during timeout and halftime in little spurts, but what you can do is pretty finite. And there's big coaching again after the game, and I wish we thought more like that in the lean world, that before the problem solving meeting or before the problem solving activity, there's lots of coaching before, there's some refine, refinement during the presentation or the execution, and there's a lot of coaching afterwards, and it builds and builds and builds and moves in the right direction. Um, number nine, the other thing worth reflecting on is NBA, sports, military, Toyota for that matter, coaches are developed internally. That's not to say you can't hire a person from the outside, but extreme emphasis is put on developing and, and having people grow and learning coaching as part of their job throughout their career. And number 10, of course, different types of coaches exist in the NBA. Head coach, assistant coach, strength coach, offense coach, defense coach, analytic expert, scouts. There's people who just do the ball handling. There's people who just do the shooting. There's a lot of room for expertise in coaching. And in lean, we've got this generic one size fits all. 
And I think we should get more specific about the type of coaching we're trying to do and the types of coaching we might employ to do that. And fully understand we don't have the big dollar budget of the NBA to do that, but I want us all to think about this, brainstorm, and see what we could do better stealing ideas from the NBA. Hope you enjoyed this video. We're gonna do it again next time, except I'm gonna drop the sports world and go into martial arts. And it might not be what you expect. Thank you.